So over half the population of Japan and millions and millions of people from around the world tuned in to watch the Olympics opening ceremony. It's an opportunity for the country to make a real statement. So this Olympics is the best one ever. What we're doing here is worthy of your attention. And so there's lights and sounds, firework displays. Japan spent nearly $30 billion on this year's games. Now, Pentecost, which we're thinking about as we spend time in Acts chapter 2 at the moment, is a world-shaping, history-defining event. This is the moment when the Holy Spirit comes. And God wants the world to know that this is a big deal. And so there are sounds. Verse 2, a rushing wind descends on Jerusalem. There are fireworks. Verse 3, as flames split from a, a source and rest over the heads of each of the disciples. The best Japanese engineer couldn't recreate this with $130 billion. God, God is doing something to get the world's attention. He wants nobody to miss what he's doing at Pentecost. And the reason that he's doing that is that he wants you to be saved. Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit comes to live in the hearts of men. And until the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart, uh, until he applies the, the blood of the Lord Jesus to you and washes away your sin, until he clothes you in Christ's righteousness, you'll always be on the road to hell. Unless you're born again, you cannot escape God's judgment. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And so this rushing wind at Pentecost and, and the tongues of flame are like a neon signpost to the world. God is saying, here is the way for you to escape your sin. Here is how to be made right with God. The Holy Spirit has come to show you, to help you grasp, to understand, not just at a head, but at a heart level, what Jesus has achieved on the cross. Now you might believe on him and be saved. Verse 15, it's nine o'clock in the morning, when verse five and six, the people of Jerusalem hear this rushing wind and so they look out of their windows and their doors and they're expecting to see swinging shutters and clouds of dust and old ladies losing their umbrellas but everything's still we're not told there's a rushing wind but the sound of a rushing wind and the sound intensifies the closer they get to this one specific place and as they head in that direction they hear another sound there's voices, men's voices, women's voices. And they're all talking, verse 11, about the amazing things that God has done. When they get close enough, they see people. And we, and we assume that the flames that were over the disciples' heads are now gone because nobody in the crowd mentions that. But they're still puzzled and perplexed because they can understand what's being said. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Maybe, some, maybe our friends from South Africa will know how this feels, but it's a very strange thing to hear your language spoken in a place you don't expect. So I was in a cafe, a little cafe in a little town in West Wales, and this guy, young guy, came up, took my order, and as he walked away, he said, sweet ass. <laughs> so when he came back, I said, where are you from? He said, oh, you wouldn't have heard of it, but a little town in New Zealand called Wanaka. <laughs> I'm from a much smaller town in New Zealand called Wyndham. <laughs> I was on top of a mountain in North Carolina. The lady asked me, "Your pet, would you mind taking a, a wee photo of me and my friends? I said, where are you from? She said, ah, you wouldn't know it, but a little place called South Gosforth in Newcastle. I used to live less than a minute away from South Gosforth. So I said, place is a dump, I'm not touching your camera. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, E, I used to live in Long Benton, like. <laughs> now, if I'd met that woman in South Gosforth and she was from South Gosforth, it would mean absolutely nothing. But hearing that Geordie accent on top of a mountain in the Appalachians, we had something to talk about. It, it meant something. 
And these crowds in Jerusalem were, verse 5, they were Jews from all over the world. All sorts of different places. The countries are listed that they're from a little bit later on. They've come to celebrate Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks that happens 50 days after the Passover. Now many of them have probably missed Passover a month earlier and now they've come for this feast and the city is packed. Most of the people speak Greek. That was the lingua franca, the common tongue that was spoken throughout the Roman Empire. But it wasn't necessarily their first language. The mother tongue depended entirely on what country they come from and there are heaps of different nationalities in Jerusalem this week. And they've spent the week speaking Greek and maybe even hearing a little bit of Hebrew at the temple. But this group, now emerging from an upper room where this sound of a wind seems to have centred on, are speaking all sorts of languages, including their own. And so the crowd gathers and they begin to ask, what's going on here? And a husband nudges his wife and says, hang on. That guy's speaking Parthian. And a wife says to her husband, I thought we were the only Pamphylians in town this weekend, but, but that lady over there, hey lady, where are you from? Uh, and somebody nudges his friend and says, she doesn't look very Egyptian, but she speaks it like a native. Uh, and the people listen as the disciples in a whole variety of different languages testify to God's goodness and the great acts that he's done. And verse 6, this crowd is bewildered. They don't know what's going on. A lot of effort is made in, in New Zealand today to include the Maori language. And, and whatever you might think of that, I think we can all accept that, that there are some people who will do it purely in wanting to encourage it because they genuinely want to make Maori people feel included. Uh, we know that not being able to hear something in your heart language is always going to be a barrier to some degree to understanding. And I want to give you three reasons why God gives his disciples this supernatural ability to speak other languages at Pentecost. Number one, he's doing this because he wants you to know the gospel is for everyone. So you try and put yourself in the shoes of a visitor in Jerusalem. You're there and you're drawn to this place by the sound of a rushing wind. And as you get closer, you hear lots of voices. That's nothing special. Jerusalem is packed. You've heard noisy crowds all week. You've even noticed some people speaking languages you've never heard before who must be visiting from other countries. But then you hear a voice and it's like cold water on a hot day. Because you don't have to translate anything in your head. You don't have to ask your wife, what does that word mean? Because you've spoken that language since you were two years old. It's the language of your heart. It's the language you think in. It's the language that you dream in. And you also know that you are a long, long way from anybody else who speaks it. And so suddenly, before you've heard a word of what's being said, you know, this is for me. Pentecost is the starting pistol to the mission that Jesus gave his disciples to go into all the world and preach the good news. That mission begins on this day. And it begins with the disciples speaking all sorts of different languages so that everyone can understand. See, the gospel is not restricted to Hebrew, the religious language of the Jews. The gospel isn't only in Greek, the common language of the Roman Empire. But every language under the sun, no matter how obscure a little backwater nation you call home, somebody is speaking your words. And so it's impossible for us to miss what God is saying. This day when the church is born is for everyone. Uh, and this message the church preaches is not to be limited by geographical boundaries. It doesn't look at Arabian culture and say, oh no, can't go there. This isn't for that group. The Lord Jesus doesn't see an Egyptian or a, a Cretan, which we know from later on in the Bible, were people who were looked down on by other nations. In fact, it's where we get the word cretin from. So these people weren't admired and looked up to. Jesus doesn't look at them and say, oh no, I'm not associating with that culture. It's the absolute opposite. And God says, regardless of where you're from, no matter how you've grown up, whatever language and culture you're saturated in, the message of Jesus Christ dying to save sinners is for you. Now in Southland today, you can hear a lot of languages spoken. There's the language that farmers use when they talk together, and I need a translator for. 
the language that old people speak is very different from how young people communicate. You'll hear the language of the political left and right. You'll hear the language of rugby players in the changing room, friends in the pub. Doesn't matter who you are or what you speak. God demonstrated 2,000 years ago this message is for you. The second reason that God causes this miracle is because the gospel is accessible. The people hearing the disciples are, are not bewildered because they can't understand what's going on, but because they can. And so the message wasn't just in their language, it was comprehensible. They, they understood it. They're not just hearing words in their tongue, but it's sentences, it's phrases, it's paragraphs that they can get their head around, it's stories they understand about the greatness of God. And so the gospel is not only for every language, but for every person. It's profound enough to make the most genius brain sweat, and yet it's simple enough that a little child can understand everything that they need to know to be saved. God is saying at Pentecost, this message is for all kinds of places, all kinds of people. And so I'll let nobody here say that they're not smart enough. I just can't get my head around the, the gospel. This message is for you. Thirdly, God is doing this because the gospel will achieve God's plan. Show you what I mean. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10. As John's given his vision in Revelation, he looks ahead at what God is going to achieve in the future. After this I looked, verse 9, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so in this verse we see what God is going to ultimately achieve through the sending of the Holy Spirit. God is going to gather to himself an uncountable number of worshippers. And as he does that, he's not going to obliterate their cultural national identities. But in different tongues, from different nationalities, he will gather his people to worship him. You know, sometimes in movies they do what's called foreshadowing, where they give you a, a little hint, a clue, at the beginning of the movie of what's going to happen at the end. And at Pentecost, God is doing cosmic foreshadowing. Because he is showing us right at the beginning of the life of his church, what he's going to achieve through the church in eternity. And here in Jerusalem, the disciples are worshipping God in tongues of all different tribes and nations. And one day God is going to do that on an ultimate scale when he gathers all his people to worship around his throne. And so all of this happens so that the world knows. And don't miss it this morning. So that the world knows the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is accessible. And the gospel will achieve the purposes of God in bringing glory to Jesus. Here's my question in light of that for us. Is our effort in God's mission today commensurate? Is it in keeping with its origin? Is our work in reaching out to Wyndham, or if you're visiting from another church, reaching out to wherever your church is located or reaching out to our friends and neighbours, does it match with how it all began? Now that's a really good challenge for me as I think about preparing sermons and what I preach on a Sunday. I have to ask myself, in light of this passage, am I presenting the gospel for everyone? Is it accessible? Or is it cluttered with unnecessary theological language? So much preaching today is like that and it is absolutely tragic because people are going to hell and we know the way of escape 
and then we fill our evangelism with language that people need a degree to understand. It's like pointing them in the right direction while putting weights in their pockets, chains around their ankles and hurdles on the path. A preacher's job is clearing the way to the cross, not hindering it. But it's also a great challenge for every single one of us as we think about our personal evangelism. You see, in light of this text, saying, I just don't do evangelism because I'm worried I'm not going to have the right words to say. That excuse doesn't stand anymore. The gospel is for everyone. And the gospel is accessible. So use the simplest words you've got. Tell people who Jesus is, what he's done for you without any frills, without any fancy bits. He will use your witness. Despite its weakness. Because the gospel is achieving God's ultimate plan. A month before his sixth birthday, Teddy from Tucson, Arizona, was given a choice by his mum. And he could go with the family to Disneyland or they could throw a party for his friends. Now, without even thinking, Teddy chose the party for his friends. And so mum went to work. She made invitations. She booked the local pizza arcade, which sounds like an awesome idea. And we should definitely get one in Wyndham. It's a pizza restaurant with computer games and bowling alley. Sounds awesome. Book the local pizza arcade and um, fill party bags. 40 kids from Teddy's school, 40 people from Teddy's school were invited to come. The day before the party, one family called up and said, look, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to make it. But there were still 32 people due to go, and so it wasn't going to spoil the day. Um, day came, nobody showed. Not a single person turned up. Tables were, were laid, covered in pizza, treats, fizzy drinks. Teddy's parents had, had booked the whole arcade. They paid for a cake for each of the kids. Not a single one showed up. Now, Teddy had a great time. He played video games with his dad. He ate pizza, his favorite food. I imagine his parents were pretty miffed. What would you think if you were his mum and dad? What do you think of those people who, who didn't even bother to call and didn't show up? They didn't have anything to do. The place was paid for. The food was provided. Everything was ready. All they needed to turn up. All they needed to do was turn up and enjoy it. The truth that we can't get away from in Acts chapter 2 is that God has made salvation completely, universally accessible. The good news that the Lord Jesus has died to rescue sinners from hell. It's for everyone. And so there is a phenomenal feast of grace and forgiveness that's running down from Jesus' cross to you. And you're invited by God. Come and Eat your fill. Have you shown up? There's no cost for you. Because the Lord Jesus has paid everything. There's nothing for you to do except repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus. Jesus has paid it all. And it's not a, a party in a pizza arcade, as good as that sounds, that's on offer. But Jesus has purchased salvation reconciliation being made right with God freedom from sin escape from hell eternity in heaven Jesus blood shed on the cross has paid it all he's paid for all of that because he loves you God has made it available and accessible you can lay hold of it today you understand there will not be a single person in hell who will be able to complain oh God didn't make it possible for me to be saved this good news is for you. What does it say about you if you don't show up? Let's pray.